College Game Day is covered by State Farm. Strong. College Game Day presented by State Farm. Chris Cotter, Dan Dockett, Sean Farnham. Look at all the papers we've got in Ooh, front of us. Look at the pocket squares. We only oh, game one. right you're here. You're missing yours. No. We only had four games tonight, but all the papers mean we got a lot to cover and we got an hour to do it. So let's get started with Kentucky. Young team. Are they finally getting together now at this point of the year? Taking on K-State. Tied at 58, 26 seconds off. Look at Barry Brown here, Farney. Just gets to the cup. Help side defense and rotation too slow getting over. And then what kind of a shot is this, Doc, with quad agree? Uh, one word, awful. Ridiculous. Silly. Uncoached. One free throw made it a three-point game. And then Shea Gill, just Alexander. Farn, it looks like he takes too long here to get into his, his shot rhythm. Well, what happened was they were trying to get Wenyan Gabriel coming up top. And defensively they did a nice job switching out onto him and then it really left Shea Gilgis Alexander on an island to shoot that shot. Barry Brown had 13 including the game winner. Xavier Sneed was sick. Five of eight from beyond the arc in 22. 24 points off turnovers for Kansas State really spelled doom for Kentucky. Here's Barry Brown who hit that game winning shot. I was able to get in there and um, we knew they were trying to, trying to block the shot just, just with their length. They've been blocking shots all game and so uh, once I got past my man, I just wanted to uh, get the ball away from uh, the people that was going to block my shot, and uh, I was able to uh, make the layup. You know, it, it just shows our, our resilience, our character of our guys. Uh, you know, we've been through a lot this season, and, and we've been able to keep fighting and battling and making the plays when it matters. Had our chance to win. Uh, didn't play particularly well for us, but still had a chance to win. Um, I should have called that timeout late. Uh, with 19 seconds to go, but we had worked on something and I thought we could catch them off guard. Veteran team should have called a timeout. Can't put that on these guys. That's on right on my shoulder. So proud of our kids, though. Proud of their effort. I mentioned the turnovers. 15 Kentucky turnovers led to 24 points. Tied for the most points off turnovers Kentucky has allowed in the last five seasons. And also of note, Kentucky had two fast break points. They just could not get out and use their athleticism to get easy buckets against this Kansas State team. And ultimately, those turnovers, really, they couldn't take care of the ball, and it doomed them. Well, they couldn't take care of the ball because Kansas State didn't let guys get by him. You know, Gilgis Alexander, I don't know, he lost a little money tonight because he couldn't get past anybody. But may I say a word about Barry Brown? Kids out there, listen up here. They got beat on the road. Kansas State did. Trounce. They come home. Does everybody complain? Sure, that's what... People do these days. They complain. They blame the coach. You know what Barry Brown did? Barry Brown sent Bruce Weber a text. Barry Brown said, I'm going to have practice tomorrow. Bruce Weber said, we can't have practice tomorrow because we have to take a day off. Barry Brown said, no, I'm conducting practice tomorrow. So kids and parents out there, instead of complaining about the coach, Barry Brown decided, I'm going to make this team better. Guess what? They had practice. Barry Brown ran to practice. Kansas State ran off four in a row. I love Barry Brown. I don't like some of you players out there and some of you uh, parents out there. I like Barry Brown. He didn't complain. He didn't complain. The coach is, you know, dogging me. He won't play me. Barry Brown said we're going to have practice. We're going to get better, save the season. There's your PSA announcement for the broadcast tonight, <laughs> and I agree with you That's 100%. True. No, it, it, it's one. You go, go to an AAU tournament, even at the middle school level. And you're My like, son! You're like, what is going on? <laughs> like, give you a hint. Your son's not going to the NBA. All right. All right. Now, back to the game, though, itself. Okay. The, here's what's the only stat that you need to look at to understand for Kentucky is one, there's two of them turnovers that led to points off of turnovers, and then PJ Washington at the free throw line. That was a problem. Okay. I mean, <laughs> it was atrocious. What is it? Eight, Eight of 20. Of 20 yeah. from the free throw line. Now, th this is a guy who had 18 and 15 on the game, and you're sitting there going, hey, box score looks great. And got to the line 20 okay. times. Okay. But 8 of 20, and it's the biggest difference of this, this game. I mean, it would have made a huge difference. Just get to 65% and, and you win the game. But, you know, the turnovers, I swear to you, we were watching the game and we're sitting there going, they, they can't get past Kansas State. No. Can't, you can't, there was no angle. Kansas State clogged the middle. Kansas State did a great job and good for Bruce Weber. Bruce Weber wasn't good enough at Illinois. Illinois is on like its 17th coach since Bruce Weber left. <laughs> Bruce he Weber. sounds the same every time. Though. I know. I good for Bruce Weber. Good guys win tonight. Moving on to the Elite Cal's Eight. A good Who would they too. play in the South in Atlanta on <laughs> Saturday? Boy, the slipper. Does it still fit? Loyola, Chicago, and Nevada. Sister Jean and company cheering on Loyola. 
Three minutes to play. That's Andre Jackson. Ramblers with the lead. Ben Richardson then here. Oh, beautiful pass right there to Jackson down low. But finally said it on a sports center when everybody in the world was watching. A lot of penetration, a lot of driving. Keep kicking, driving, kicking. Finally had that nail. People were tuning in across America. They were all nice. over the world. Uh, Caleb Martin put the Wolfpack within one, but Marcus Towns, that's the shot right there of maybe the tournament for Loyola. Uh, every game, it's the right. shot of the tournament. That's all they do is hit game winners. I mean, that's the amazing thing. These guys sit there and go, it's a shot of a lifetime. No, it's not. It's a shot of the game for you guys. Shot of the Sister Jean oh, hugging goodness. everybody. Loyola Chicago moves on to the Elite Eight for the first time since 1963 when they cut down the nets. Marcus Towns, you saw him with what was ultimately the game-winning three. He had 18 points, five assists out, six of ten shooting. Clayton Custer, has been sensational. He was, again, in this game, seven of nine from beyond the arc. And Loyola advances to take on K-State. I mean, they're, they're a really, really good offensive team. There's no doubt about it. And, um, I mean, they couldn't miss. I'll just, I'll probably remember it for the rest of my life. I mean, uh, it doesn't really get any better than that. Um, Clay made a great play, got downhill, uh, kicked me to the corner. Uh, the guy came flying at me. I just gave him a little shot fake and I shot it and it went in and it was just, I mean, that's that's something you dream about. You're, you're in the Sweet 16, you hit a big shot like that. It just, I mean, it's just amazing. They don't quit. They're resilient. It's different guys, different nights. They're completely an unselfish group. I mean, they're just about not caring who gets it. They just keep believing. They keep believing. They keep buying in. And uh, so it's just grown. And we haven't thought about the total victory margin. We've just talked about put it in the bank. Next one, we're hungry, we're greedy, we want more. I like Porter Mosier's suit, shirt, tie combination oh, yeah. there. I do. It's been getting a little bit of love uh, and then maybe some hate on uh, social media, but I give it love. Uh, Loyola, the second team in NCAA tournament history to win its first three games by two points or less. The other was St. Joe's in 1981, who got wrecked by... Well, they got Bobby Knight. Indiana, but that was Indiana, a, the next that was time a out. fluke. St. Joe's had to play Indiana at Indiana. Uh, yeah, Come back on. then, I mean, it was a little bit different back Isaiah then, right? And those guys, they had no chance. I was at that game. What about this Loyola team? Because now they're beyond just Cinderella type of a situation here, Farney. They could go to the Final Four. Yeah, I, they have a legitimate chance, obviously, and a big part of it is because of how they play. And we mentioned it, we joke about it during the highlights, but they do an excellent job of getting in the paint and then kicking and moving without the ball and then redriving time and time again. And when you apply that pressure on a defense, eventually they're going to crack. You're going to find either an open shot from the outside or you're going to get something easy at the cup. And tonight, 46 of their 60 nine points came in the paint. That's ridiculous. Back in the day, the paint was throw it to a big guy on the block. He turns, he, you know, whatever, and goes and scores. That's not this. This is drive it. This is drive it, find the next. You saw the little wraparound pass. Yeah. Yep. They don't stop the ball. The ball continues to move, and that is so hard to guard. And look, Porter Mosier has come to Rogers Park in Chicago, and he established a style of play. He recruited to that style. It doesn't necessarily mean it's conventional. There's not a big, there's not, just a bunch of guys that like each other, believe in their coach, and they keep, as you said, they keep putting pressure. I don't have a shot. I'm, I'm going to get it to you. You're going to have a better shot. You're going to have a better shot. And I'll tell you what, again, we, we want to talk about magic, and that's great, but the magic is how they're coached and how they play. Well, and here's the magic, okay? Virginia, U of A, Tennessee, Cincinnati, Kentucky. Those were all the teams. All right, this is what we're going to look at now, K-State versus Loyola to get to a Final Four. It's amazing. And you talk about, too, the Missouri Valley Conference with Wichita. Barney, I look at this Florida State team, 13 players in the box score. I mean, they just come at you. And Leonard Hamilton, this time of year, when you got a Gonzaga team without Tilly Tilly, yeah. he was on the bench, it, th their depth was hurt even more with that. There was no Tilly Tilly, and then it changed the rotation obviously for Gonzaga, but this is all about what Florida State does. Florida State in that highlight, where did every single one of their baskets get come from? Right underneath the basket. That's where they're going. You know it. You talk about in the scouting report, and yet you still can't stop it. And Gonzaga's been a really good defensive team down the stretch of this regular season, all right, and going in through conference tournament, and even in the NCAA tournament. 56% of their two-point field goals tonight is what Florida State shot. 
and a lot of those were inside the paint. And, and again, you can try to simulate it, Coach, but they've got length on length on length coming off the bench. Only one guy in double figures for Florida State. And you know what's interesting about Florida State is how confident every guy is that comes in. Again, parents, your kid can come off the bench. Just play like you're supposed to play. <laughs> Kids, you can come off the bench. And you are preaching this ten morning. Ten guys. Coach, are you coaching a team that we don't know about no, right now? No, saying. Ten, got some angry parents ten. back in Indiana. <laughs> I, just, I just got to know. Like, no, no, none of that. I'm just trying to help America. Uh, uh, ten guys play double-digit minutes, and nobody really cared. All anybody did was do what they do, Sean. Yep. They went to the rim. If they, When it was time to come out, they came out. They got in a stance. They defended. You know, Florida State wasn't great late in the year. I mean, there wasn't no. anything that said, hey, look at this. This is going to come. Gonzaga has always been Gonzaga. I did not think, and I said this on a lot of radio shows, I was not that impressed with Gonzaga watching them in person. They should have lost to Greensboro. Greensboro made a bad yep. offensive play when they were up two under a minute. Ohio State outscored them 20 points during most of the game just got down 15 to nothing and now you take out you know Tilly Tilly and you have a different rotation as you said so you know what it's a lesson man guys just coming in and playing and not worrying about anything other than winning now, and I like Leonard Hamilton's look better than Porter Mosier's look. I, I agree with you. Happy birthday, I Coach Hamilton. I, I think it's your you birthday. Like it. No, I like Porter Mosier's better. But, that, hey, to each his own. Hey, you, my, if you want to wear a mock turtleneck I just want to make sure that, that the parents of my team that I coach know that I didn't say anything to Dan. I like all the parents on my team. <laughs> you <laughs> and won't. No, you <laughs> won't. I do. And now you can dress like older. Porter Mosier if you That kid doesn't wish. play. He doesn't get enough touches. The other game <laughs> out west. A&M out of the SEC. An up and down team all year long, but playing in the Sweet 16, taking on a Michigan team who's won 11 straight coming into this one. Mo Wagner, they were on fire. They couldn't miss coach. First half of this game, forget it. 99 points. They had 14 to 24 from beyond the arc. Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahman has been a superstar for the last really all year long, but the last couple of months, especially for Michigan. Let me tell you something. 24 points, seven, re seven assists, one turnover. He is the most underappreciated great player in college basketball. Let's hear from Billy Kennedy. You had a good run for A&M, but it came to an end on this night. Felt like we ran into a buzzsaw. I thought Michigan, the first eight to ten minutes, played about as well as anybody we played against this year. We knew that we could pick and choose our spots on offense. And uh, we didn't shoot too well in uh, Wichita, but we knew that we were confident in coming into this game that we could hit and knock down shots. I was just wondering when they were going to miss. And so uh, when they was able to hit the three ball so well, then it kind of opened up their, you know, the driving lanes and then they was able to get into the lane. And so, uh, uh, like, again, we came out in the second half and gave ourselves opportunity, but, you know, they came out and played uh, hard as well. And so uh, it just we couldn't get to that, um, to that point where we come back. You can just have games where everything's just happening your way and you just try and get through the game. And that's survive because you, you look at that lead, you could, it, could, it could go south. And um, we just did not just enough to win. But you did more than just enough to win, Coach. You housed them from the start. I mean, you talk about shooting 62% from the floor for the game, 58% from three. Wagner and Abdul Rahman combined seven of ten from beyond the arc. They couldn't miss. And we're not even talking about how great of a defensive team Michigan has been all year because they have. The offense was just sensational tonight. The offense was great. You just mentioned it. But 12 steals, six by Xavier Simpson. And Xavier Simpson put a ton of pressure, ton of pressure on Texas A&M. Look, John Beeline said earlier this week, he said, look, we got through two games and played awful. Right. And he, you know, and when, when a coach says that publicly, Guess what that means? That means he is going to bust it in practice, yeah. make these guys get better, not let them sit down and say, hey, we're in the Sweet 16. Why are you bothering this, coach? So John Beeline got that defense revved up, but I, I, I'll say it, and I'll keep saying it, and I'll never stop saying John Beeline is one of the two, three best coaches in college basketball, and Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahman is one of the great basketball players in the country. Yeah, you look at it, the highest points per possession of any team we've seen so far in the tournament is about 1.38 per possession is what they scored. A lot of that because of three-point shots in the first half. Uh, but the, the defense disrupted Texas A&M. They didn't get their first look in their offense. They did not have the easy post entries. So you did not see a lot of easy lobs to Robert Williams underneath. Right. The big guys did their part, but they really had to work for it. T.J. Starks never got going. And, and quiet is kept. He's the key to the offense for Texas A&M. If he's scoring... Everybody starts feeling off the energy, but when he struggles, goes two for 11 today, five turnovers. Those turnovers lead to points. Uh, all of a sudden, things don't go so well for Texas A&M, and 
Coach Kennedy's right. And, they, and I've been there in the NCAA tournament, too. As a player at UCLA, we played Iowa State when they had Tinsley and Pfizer. Oh, my gosh. We came out of that game. We were down 15 before we even blinked. And I was like, oh, well, this is over. <laughs> and that's kind of how it yeah. was for Texas A&M. It was a definitive win for Michigan. You look at the uh, West Finals, Coach. Go ahead. As we put it well, up here, well, Florida State going to take on Michigan. Again, you know, Florida State's going to be deep. Michigan, here's interesting about Michigan. May I go on another rant about about players yeah, just caring can, about winning? Keep Remember it concise. Jordan Poole? Yeah. Jordan mm -hmm. Poole hit the game winning. How many minutes he played in this game? Played nine minutes, and Jordan Poole is going to have an impact. You mark my words, in the Michigan-Florida State game. Jordan Poole will have impact, and I think Jerron Simmons will as well. Eight different players hit threes for Michigan. Both benches are going to be outstanding. That's going to be a fun game on Saturday. When we come back, we'll talk about Friday's action, and we'll start in the East with top seed of Villanova, hoping to keep it chalk. You're watching College Game Day, covered by State Farm. The East region will commence on Friday, and it's pretty much the closest thing we have to chalk uh, as far as all four regions go. One, five, three, and two. The seeds that will battle for a spot in the Elite Eight. And at the top of that bracket, the number one seed, Villanova, will take on West Virginia. Offensive efficiency against Press Virginia. A couple of strengths here. Which one will win out? You know, Jay Wright's been here before. I think it's a team that has grown throughout the year and is, is really playing their best basketball right now, as, as we are. Um, a really unique style of play that you just, you know, you don't see any other time during the year or from any other opponent. So it, I think it's going to be a kind of game where we're going to have to get in it, kind of take a punch in the mouth there for a second, and, um, and then get ready to adjust because it's hard to simulate. And we just haven't seen it anywhere else this year. I felt like ever since our freshman year, we've always been underrated. We've always been the underdogs coming into any game we've played. So we always had that extra chip on our shoulder. Um, me and Dax, we feel like we never got the credit we deserve. We feel like we the best backcourt in the nation. But I guess don't nobody else besides us see us that way. So we always play with an extra chip on our shoulder because we always got something to prove. Javon Carter, defensive wizard, also averaging 17 a game. How about the bottom half? Three and two seeds. Texas Tech coming out of that really tough Big 12. They've been through the battles all year long. They're tested. And then Purdue coming out of the Big 10. Isaac Haas, unlikely to play, but might be. He's a game time decision. What do you think, Matt Painter? I just think their ability to, to stay with it and in terms of sustainability. You know, like guys, you get guys to play hard in spurts. You get guys to play hard in a certain stretch that you know they play hard for 40 minutes they make it tough on you they try to push you out of your out of your uh, comfort zone as much as possible um uh, that's the biggest thing they're so physical and tough and they rebound the ball so um if you're not strong with the ball they're going to take it from you what i told our guys is this i know purdue but i know this they're well coached they don't beat themselves they'll play as hard as anybody on our schedule uh, they do a great job with shot selection uh, they're going to make changes and adjustments throughout the game. And I'm saying this based on firsthand experience, having been in the game with them a couple of years ago. Yeah, Arkansas Little Rock, you got the win over them a couple of years ago in a big upset in the tournament. Time for the Wendy's. Wooden watch. Carson Edwards um, hasn't really been shooting very well lately. When you talk about this Purdue team without Haas, if he doesn't play, and Harms is certainly played well in his stead and Matthias is there as well but Carson Edwards is the engine that makes this team run and Doc with him not shooting the ball very well and without Isaac Haas if he's not playing I mean so much is going to be put on not only Carson Edwards but Vincent Edwards too to help this team advance you know sometimes on a team there's a guy that settles you down and sometimes it's a point guard sometimes it's a big guy sometimes it's a wing well you know what Isaac Haas was that guy and you saw it at the beginning of the game against Butler. Look, the Edwards brothers, they've got to play because now they're the guys that settle it down. Carson Edwards is a great offensive player, but he's been rushing things. Mm -hmm. And early in the game, Vincent Edwards against Butler got two fouls. Well, guess what? When he went out, Purdue was completely stuck. So Matt Painter put him back in. These two guys are huge because with Purdue, when things were crazy, they just threw it inside, and it all settled down. Now it's going to have to be these two guys 
Vince Edwards doesn't have a problem kind of fitting in. Carson Edwards sometimes goes and tries to do too much, and sometimes it hurts his team. Well, you look and you look at their opponent in, in the Red Raiders at Texas Tech, it'd be easy to say, hey, Keenan Evans is back 100% from that, that toe injury, and he's been looking great. But I want to go back to what you were saying about the offense for Purdue. That's why I look at the defense for Texas Tech. They've done a great job throughout the course of this NCAA tournament contesting shots. They're making it difficult for their opponent. They're not letting them settle in. They're making sure that they're there on the catch. And this is an experienced team. This is a team that has the toughness and the grit that's necessary to play a team like Purdue and find a way to win. And I really like Chris Beard's team, uh, especially with the defensive end of the floor and how they're playing. Co they're connected to one another right now. Hey, for more on uh, the Wendy's Wooden Watch, go to ESPN.com and search Wooden for more on Carson Edwards and those others that are up for the award. Let's talk about the top half of this bracket, too, with the number one seed, Villanova, taking on West Virginia. What a classic matchup between these two teams when you talk about West Virginia over 20 points per game off turnovers it's press Virginia after all and then Villanova they don't turn the ball very often they don't turn it over very often very efficient on the offensive end so Farney when you talk about Villanova and you talk about a point guard in a jail and Brunson takes care of the basketball and that doesn't work into the hands of West Virginia. Yeah, you, you look at Villanova overall. I mean, Villanova to me is all about efficiency at the offensive end of the floor and they, they have multiple weapons that can beat you. They are balanced with six guys that average over 10 points per game. We saw it the other night. DiVincenzo goes for 18 in the first half, doesn't score a point in the second half. Then you look at Bridges in the f second half, he scores 22 of his 23 points. They can get going. It could be a different guy and that's what makes it difficult for teams to match up with mm -hmm. yeah and for West Virginia look let, let, let's Javon Carter stop with the whole underdog in every game you played Maris you played new NJIT you played Morgan State Wheeling Jesuit I'm sure that you were the better the defensive and offensive uh, Wheeling Jesuit's pretty darn they're good they're not though. bad they'll move the ball around a little bit <laughs> you got to keep with them look I do think this though I think the West Virginia defense now I've said all year it's overrated in half court but in full court, they get you scrambling around. And, you know, you're talking about the great offense of Villanova. Well, one of their problems, Villanova, is this. It's playing against pressure. And you're going to see this all day long. They make you do things like you just saw right there. Inexplicably, just turn the ball over. Also, the key in this game, you talk about making shots, and you're so right. I mean, look, in the NBA, college kids make open shots. NBA players make tough shots. Villanova can make both. But here's the deal. If you get sped up, like if you get going faster than you're used to, and that's what West Virginia likes to do, open shots aren't that easy because you're not sure you've got them. And that's going to be key for Villanova if they can stay slow against that pressure. Let me ask you, because of Jalen Brunson's experience, I mean, and I know he hasn't seen this often, but is he the type of guy, though, that can calm everybody down from that position and still find shots against the Oh, team? yeah. In fact, you know, Claire asked me to talk about West Virginia's pressure, right? Our producer. <laughs> I'm taking Villanova in this game because of that right there. Jalen Brunson, I'm not ever betting against yeah. him, are you? Never. I mean, that's, that's why yeah. I look at it, and I just think, again, balanced offense, and yeah. it starts with who's the best player on the court, and <laughs> Javon Carter, sorry. Yeah. It's Jalen Brunson. Yeah, in this case, you're, you're not the best back. Yeah. You can have a chip on your shoulder all you want, but those two guys are bad men. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about the Midwest, talk about Blue Bloods in college basketball, including an 11 seed Blue Blood. Oh, and by the way, a team that is pretty good in football, but trying to prove they belong in basketball as well. Wendy's Wooden Watch is brought to you by Wendy's. Proud spot. Clemson at the top to Clemson team veteran backcourt certainly guided them through the ACC Kansas many people thought it might be Texas Tech or West Virginia this year but Kansas won their 14th straight Big 12 title Bill Self let's talk about it they were probably the most impressive team I felt like in the first weekend uh, 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 you know they had a really nice win against New Mexico State but but against Auburn that was a that was a different level that that I think probably anybody played at last weekend. Devontae Graham we know very well and is an outstanding player 17 points eight assists a game great pace can score in the paint make threes puts pressure on your defense. We just got to uh, contain him try to keep him on the paint uh, you know make him take tough contested jumpers and uh, keep them off the glass and out of transition. What's fun about coaching in these tournaments is getting the opportunity to study other teams. And I've seen Bill's teams from afar because I'm a basketball junkie and I study everything. 
Um, but to watch him do what he's doing with this group, uh, unbelievable coaching job to take a different kind of team and to still win the conference and get them to play at this level. He just, it's obviously why he's one of the best coaches in our game. The 9.30 game in Omaha, Syracuse and Duke. Bayheim's 2-3 zone that Coach K even implemented at times this year. So it's going to be a team that keeps the scores in the 50s against the Duke team that can really fill it up. Here's Marvin Beck. Syracuse is going to be a, a different team. Um, you know, we last game we both had pretty bad games as teams as a whole. We did not play well at Duke. We didn't shoot well at Duke. We made some very bad plays. Uh, I, I think we'll play better against their zone this time. I think I heard Marvin mention something about it, that, that you know, they're different and we are too. Uh, they're better, we're better. Duke's a very, very good offensive team. They play well against man-to-man -man end zones. They've seen both all year. We have preparation to play zone against everybody, obviously, but as far as trying to execute against a zone and a zone that's as big and as long as Syracuse's is, it's, it's difficult to actually prepare for that. His use of the zone, uh, he's used it a little bit in the past, but I think with this team, he felt this was the right defense for this team, and that's kind of what I used to go through when we played both. Syracuse, as I mentioned, they don't score a great deal. As a matter of fact, first team to win three straight tournament games, scoring 60 points or less since Villanova in 1985. Duke, meanwhile, averaging 88 points per game in their two NCAA tournament uh, wins, and that's pretty much par for the course throughout the year. So, you know, when you talk about this Duke team, talk about Syracuse and defensively, Doc. It's, it's always been about that zone, and why is it that every year you know what's coming, but nobody can beat that zone? You know, I, I don't know, and it's really made really good coaches look awful. Like, I still don't understand why Jaron Jackson or Miles Bridges wasn't in the middle of that zone against Syracuse. Here's a problem that you have if you're Syracuse in, in your zone, is that you can just throw the ball up to Bagley, who might be the most skilled big kid in the country, and then if you want to look down, you can throw it to Carter. The zone is long. The zone is scouted. And here's the deal. Like, that zone does not play one way. Jim Beheim has told me on numerous times, in fact, he told me this week against Michigan State, when they had Carter, a kid averaging less than a point, in the middle in the second half, they just spread it out. Mm -hmm. So they'll scout it like man-to-man, -man, Sean. Now, is a heck of a difference between scouting it and being able to stop throwing it up in the air to a 6'11 kid that's a first or second round pick in the draft who can shoot it, drive it in Bagley, or drop it down or kick it out. I think it's going to be really, really tough for Syracuse. Well, and they've seen it already, right? So it's not like the shock factor of like, right. wait a second, like we haven't seen this right. before. Now, they can talk about it at the press conference and say all the things right, but they know what they have to do to execute against it, and you're exactly right. They're going to play through their post, and if they don't, I'd be shocked. And sometimes the best offense for them will be the missed shot because sometimes in the zone, spaced out a little differently, you don't box out very well, and I think that's where Duke has the availability to kind of hurt them on the glass, and in particular, Marvin Bagley. Look at the way they work and crashing, shooting the gaps, even Grayson Allen getting his hands on the ball. This is where the length of Duke causes problems for the length of Syracuse. And as you mentioned, I always like to go with the baddest dude on the block. The baddest dude on the block on this game is without question Marvin Bagley. He's the yeah, best player on the floor. If he's not, then Carter is. You know, I mean, both and if of he's them. not, then Grayson Allen might be. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they've got a lot of guys that can go. Yeah, and you know, to, to say, I do think this though. I think that the zone of Duke helps Syracuse in this game because Syracuse isn't going to be under great pressure. So they can shorten the game, long possessions, which is what Syracuse wants. Let's be honest. They're averaging, what, under 60, yep. and it's yeah. not because of their offense. It's also because they – not because of their defense. It's because they're playing slow offensively as well. Well, the baddest dude in the other game in the Midwest is Devontae Graham. He's been unbelievable, and, and rightfully so, the Big 12 Offensive Player of the Year. Time for making the assist presented by State Farm. Graham averaging over 18 points and seven assists in his two NCAA tournament games. He's responsible for over 44% of Kansas' points in the tournament this year.
in Kansas and Clemson. You know, here's the thing, though. Devontae Graham did it all year long. And, Farney, when I look at Kansas down the stretch, Malik Newman was bombing shots. I'm going I'm to steal Lee Corso's line, okay? Because you're right. talking about DeVoe being the baddest guy, maybe Devontae Graham being the baddest guy. Not so fast. <laughs> Have you seen Malik Newman play since Ridiculous. the Big 12 tournament? Oh. My guy is playing like he was a one-and-done guy. He told me on a court at the SEC media day, standing next to Ben Simmons, I'm not going to be in Mississippi State my sophomore year. He was right, yeah. but he didn't go to the league. He transferred. That red shirt year has really helped him. And it took him a while to it find took him a goal, while. But boy, has he taken off here. And what it allows you to do is have a game where Devontae Graham doesn't even get into double figures. And yet Kansas still rolls. And that's the role that Malik Newman has taken on. He's playing like a guy that out of high school everybody was so excited about. His efficiency has been great. His shot making has been great. Yeah, well, not so fast to you. And not so fast to you, because the baddest guy in this game is going to be Elijah Thomas. You don't even know who Elijah Thomas is, Connor. He's not even one of those guards I was <laughs> no, talking he's about. he's a fifth leading scorer, but when Clemson is good, this dude is a bad man. I've seen it too often. He plays inside. Let me give you against Ohio State. I'm going back to December. He had no points, no touches, no shots in the first half. Guess what? Clemson's down 13. Second half, they go to him, and he just dominates. I think he's really good. He gets to the offensive glass. He averages 12 points a game. He blocks shots. He is active. And the best thing he does is he's the center fielder of the defense. He starts talking. He plays great defense on a high ball screen and can get back. If Clemson wins this game, if they win it, you mark my words, Elijah Thomas is going to have a monster game, and they're going to interview him after the game. Well, that's good, because you and I are working together tomorrow night, and I'll come on and be like, <laughs> you were right, Elijah Thomas is the man. I'm so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got uh, some coaching news to get to as well. As always, this time of year, some movement. Including this young man right here, Danny Early, is on the move. Coach Mack, will he be on the move? We'll discuss that coming up. And let's not forget, we is college game day covered by State Farm. Earlier tonight in Atlanta, the 11th seed Cinderella Loyola Chicago taking on Nevada. And it was about Nevada making a shot there, but Loyola Chicago, and this was a big one right here. Marcus Towns, the three-pointer salted away for Loyola. Sister Jean, what do you got? It just feels so much that so emotional for me that I am so grateful to the young men and to Porter, of course, for doing this. I'm trying to keep myself calm, but I know that I'm not. And um, one of the things Custer said to me as he came off the court was, Sister Jean, we broke your bracket. I said, I don't care how far you break my bracket. As long as you've broken it, you have to go a little more now. And it's just, I'm happy for us, for my community, for Loyola, for the city of Chicago, and for the world, because we have people watching us all over the world. This is really my first NCAA um, appearance and at a real game. I've watched on television for years before all you guys were born, and I've watched, but never have I attended one before, and I've loved every second. It's been such a great, such a great trip for me. First time they to the Elite Eight since 1963 when they cut down the nets. Who will they play? Kansas State. Beautiful move right there by Barry Brown late to give K-State the lead. And then, not really the shot that Kentucky and Coach Cal, I'm sure, wanted. Shea Gilgis Alexander missing the three. And K-State advances. And check this out, guys. In Atlanta on Saturday, one of these two teams is going to the Final Four, Farney. You, you didn't have this in your bracket? No. Uh, did anybody have this? What did we no. get, 18 million it's, brackets? It's the first time in tournament history we've ever seen a nine go against an 11. I mean, this, this region, and we were talking about it. You look at these matchups that are going to be going to the Final Four, and we'll, we'll get into both matchups here. But yeah. you, this was a region in particular that you had Arizona, <laughs> Kentucky, Virginia. We were talking about how tough it was going to be for Virginia to get by Arizona and C Kentucky. Cincinnati. Tennessee, yeah. I mean, that was the teams in this Loaded. region. And none of them are there. It, it, it has absolutely been decimated, and it's going to be a lot of fun to see whether or not Cinderella can still dance for Loyola, and I, and I think they can. 0.1% of the brackets had it in our bracketology on ESPN.com. That's actually more than I thought. I would have thought it would have been even less than that. We actually I had been nobody, which is basically right. nobody. But look, don't mess with nuns. I mean, it's that simple. I did when I was in third grade. Sister Geraldine, swear to God, Sister Geraldine kicked Andy Atar and I out of third grade 
because she described me as, in her 48 years, the most disruptive student she ever had. Was it accurate? She was right. I mean, you, you've done nothing in the years since to disprove her. Well, the problem is my mother was a third grade teacher at the public school. It was a bad conversation, but you cannot mess with a couple of things. Number one, Porter Moser's done a great job with his team. They drive it, they kick it, they find it, they defend it, and they've got a little divine intervention. So, hey, look, I learned a long time ago, don't mess with nuns. I don't mess with nuns. I think Loyola's going to get it done. Let's take a look at the West region, too, because it's also a little bit of a surprise down here. Michigan, who was sort of up and down, Doc, and I know you, you yeah. watched them a lot in the Big Ten, but they were certainly up today. They dominated against Texas A&M from the start. And a Florida State team that is so deep, Leonard Hamilton just, he sends them out there in waves. Yeah, let me get to Michigan here. You know, Michigan... They play defense. Now, John Beeline has always been known as an offensive guy, Farney. He's always been known as, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, you do this, we do He has, at the end of a season, when he was at West Virginia, had over 273 different things they could run within their offense. That's great. That's fine. They still run good offense. But, man, those guards up front, they guard. Xavier Simpson, he guards. And, and again, this is John Beeline's best defensive group. I'm not going to say it's his most athletic, but I am going to say between Abdul Rahman, Simpson, Matthews on the perimeter, they are good at keeping you in front. And then inside, Mo Wagner's a good offensive player, but my man clogs up the middle, and he is always in the right. So this is Beeline's best defensive team. Yeah, and they're going to have to be a good defensive team against that dribble drive offense yeah. uh, because Florida State wants to do one thing. They want to get to the rim. They want to be able to finish at the cup. The interesting thing for me is going back to December, I had Florida State at Florida, and it was the first game that Florida State was really playing any real competition this year. Right. And Leonard Hamilton said, we're going to find out a lot about my team. He goes, but I like my team. And he kept saying that throughout the entire shooter. I like my team. I think we're going to have one of those great years. I don't know if he saw it being this great because they had some inconsistencies in the ACC. But what he did know that he had was length. What he knows that he has is depth. And that has yeah. caused a lot of problems. And as we've seen with other matchups, too, it's hard to simulate when you've got a bunch of dudes out on the floor that have 6'8", six, 6'9", six, seven-foot-long wingspans uh, that are covering up a lot of ground. And they can do that defensively. They can be disruptive there. And then offensively, again, if they can get to the cup, they will damage. They you will mentioned damage. their bench. I mean, uh, the Knowles bench outscored Gonzaga's 30 to 6 yeah. in this Ten game. guys played yeah. double digit uh, minutes. And, and for Michigan, I mean, they had eight different players hit three pointers. So you're going to have a contribution from both deep benches on both these teams. It's going to be fun to watch. Got some coaching news to talk about. Chris Mack is going to meet with Louisville over their head coaching uh, vacancy right now. When you talk about the job he's done at Xavier, any Xavier fan would say, oh, we're gonna, it's going to be tough losing him. But that Louisville job is a great job. It's a great job if you know that there's no sanctions coming down the road. But I think there's too much uncertainty for, for me. If I was Chris Mack, I would pass on this. His wife is from Louisville. I would pass on it as well. Look, let's be honest, Xavier, basketball is it. And Xavier in a great league now. I mean, look, they've jumped around a few leagues. Now they're in the Big East. It's great. They have everything in their favor in terms of facility. They have a great facility. And it's the only show there. And I think Chris Mack has a great situation. You go to Louisville, you don't know what's coming. You have no idea what's coming. Nobody has any idea no. right. what's coming. And you have to think Chris Mack is going to be at the top of athletic directors lists every year. So yes. if he passes on Louisville this year, maybe next year another big job opens but, but up. But you do, but the one thing though, and, and I'm going to correct myself a little bit, Louisville is a national It's a great job. It's a it, national If you don't have the, that hanging Look, if, over the, if there's time. nothing hanging over it, I'm saying, right. hey, great opportunity. Right, go. Go. Yeah. But the exactly. uncertainty is what gets me there. Yeah. Uh, Danny Hurley has accepted the UConn head coaching job, and he did such a great job at Rhode Island. And UConn Farney is an interesting situation here. Not in the best conference. I mean, let's face it, yep. they'd be much better off if they were in the Big East or playing somewhere else in the American. So it's got a kind of a rebuilding job at UConn, and you're playing in the American. Well, and you've your, got your fan base isn't giddy about Tulane coming into town. I'm sorry, they're just not. You know, so you've got to energize it. And if you're looking for a coach that's going to add some life and some fire and passion to the program, you found the right run in Danny Hurley. This guy's all about toughness, all about fire. I love the way he works the sideline. Mm -hmm. uh, he's calmed down a little bit over the last two years, but he can flat out coach. He'll get it done. He'll excite the fans once yeah, again. Yeah, and I think he's a lot like Jim Calhoun when Jim Calhoun went there, Northeastern to, to, to stores, and now you th look at Danny Hurley from Rhode Island. Perfect guy, as you said. He is tough, he is hard-nosed, and he has every connection in the East, in the Northeast, that you want to recruit. I think it's a great hire. Not a good hire, mm -hmm. a great hire for UConn. All right, when we come back, the best moments of the day, and there were plenty of them, so don't go anywhere, folks. Loyola and Florida State advancing along with K-State and Michigan.
state of those three teams, guys, those really high seeds, which one do you think has the best shot of advancing to the Final Four? Loyal. You really do? I think the, I think the Ramblers have the best chance. They, they can beat Kansas State. They can be in the Final Four. What do you think, Doc? I'll say the same. I think Loyola as well. I'm not going against Sister. I told you, I don't Sister go against Sister Jean. Dogs. She's an international sensation. They'll hit you. Brewers. Boom. And, and parents. Boom. Parents, act right. Otherwise, Doc.